Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us again on Celebrating Act Two. Art and I are with the fabulous virtual gourmet. And the wonderful thing about John Mariani is that he is both a food and travel editor and writer of great renown. And um, your credentials, John, set you apart from a lot of other people in their field. You were uh, uh, you worked from Esquire for many years, did their uh, cover story for many years, Bloomberg News, Forbes, and my favorite is still the virtual gourmet. Mine too. At johnmariani.com. Which anybody can get free of charge at johnmariani.com. <laughs> You've been, right. you've been listening to John's uh, uh, shameless sh pictures for your uh, website, haven't you? Yes. Uh, so but let me add to that just for a moment. Um, uh, besides the, the, the articles, and they, they are far and wide, uh, and you've got this wonderful archive of 10 or 20 years, so you can actually go back. And a lot of the stuff is not dated, but the, the illustrations are so lush and rich. Thank uh, you. It's yeah. like I remember. Uh, it's almost like uh, uh, back in the day, you'd pick up a slick magazine from a high-end magazine, and this is the kind of stuff that you saw. And mm -hmm. it's just—it's nice that I guess it's just part of your DNA, uh, and, and the fact that you use them is—it uh, uh, just makes going to johnmariani.com a wonderful experience. Uh, well, speaking of, you. you're welcome. Good speaking fine. of <laughs> wonderful experiences. Is going to uh, Europe uh, a wonderful experience anymore? Like, uh, why don't we just uh, pick on one country, Italy? Well, Italy is still as popular as ever. No, let me rephrase that. It is maddeningly popular. It is agonizingly popular, uh, oh. as is, as is uh, France and England and so forth, but mainly talk about the big cities, and there has to be a distinction there. Um, I go to Italy at least once a year, sometimes twice a year, and uh, I love every square inch of it, but it has gotten very arduous to go to the big cities, meaning that you take your life in your hands, not because you're going to get mugged in Venice, but because, but because in Venice it is so overrun with tourists that you could get crushed on a bridge, which a friend of mine who was in a wheelchair almost was. I mean, that you that go across the the uh, uh, the bridge there, and uh, there are hundreds of people on this side trying to get over this side, and us going over this side. You get crushed. Because, unfortunately, they built them very very sturdily in those in those days, so um, we didn't get crushed through the bridge. But Venice is impossible, and they had these up until recently. They had these cruise ships come in, which had three four thousand people on them. Oh, and they would just engorge Venice from 11 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And then they'd leave. And all they do is eat pizza and buy tchotchkes along the way. Um, Venice has fewer Venetians living in it today than it had even 10, 20 years ago. People just can't bear living there anymore because they're just under assault. Um, Florence, which is a very artistic city, of course, um, <clears throat> equally. Um, to get into some of the uh, monuments there, you have to wait on line after line after line. Um, you have to get uh, tickets to go everywhere where you didn't used to have to get tickets to go everywhere. Um, but Rome is by far the worst, and it gets worse and worse and worse. When I was there four or five years ago, it was there so bad that to get into the Vatican, you either had to have a pre-ticket, uh, which you could get online to get into the Vatican Museum, or you're going to be online for three hours, um, and then you're going to be crushed in these hallways. Um, so that's no fun, and get into St. Peter's and so forth. Um, as I said, uh, um, I was this time I was at the Trevi Fountain, and there were probably three to four thousand people on the Trevi at the Trevi Fountain. You couldn't get close to it. I, it. It took me five minutes to push my way through because I was going to a restaurant just two blocks away. Um, Rome is dirtier than ever. Uh, they don't clean the um, they don't clean the buses. Um, I, I asked a concierge at my hotel. I said, now, what bus would I take to get down to the uh, <clears throat> to the Vittorio Emanuele? He says, I don't know. He says, I haven't taken a bus in 20 years. Nobody takes the buses because it's so awful. Um, not very dependable. You could wait five minutes for the number four, 
and then wait 20 minutes for the number six. In between, there are two more number fours. So it, it doesn't make any sense. Um, the subways go this way and that way, and that's it. I mean, <laughs> they don't go very far because every time they want to dig up a new subway, they find a Roman ruin, and ah. that stops. Uh, stops yeah. the thing. Um, so Rome has been ruined. It's very, very expensive as a result. Uh, as I said on another program, because of global warming, the peak time to go visit Rome, uh, the peak season is now from end of March through the end of November. I mean, it's just crazy. Um, the prices for hotels, which might have been a, a great bargain at $99, are now $200, $300 for the same hotel. Um, so it's not a great time to visit uh, Italy, except to visit the smallest cities. Now, I will say, as I said in an article I did for uh, Forbes and the Virtual Gourmet, that the one saving grace is that the food in Rome and elsewhere in the United States, the restaurants are as good as ever and no more expensive than they were, seems to be five years ago. Everywhere I went, whether it's Rome or elsewhere, pastas range from $12 to maybe $17, $18 for big portions that you could share with another person. I mean, this is amazing. And main courses, even for fish, is going to be in the 20s. So the prices haven't risen. The other thing is because they said all of these tourists, um, like those in Venice and elsewhere, they go to the pizzerias or they go to the most popular trattorias that are in the in the, in the guidebooks. And they don't spend much money. They leave town by four o'clock. And uh, but that means that most of the best and by best, I mean, from the trattoria, trattoria level on up, the small ones, the family ones, most are not full at all. We went to a favorite old place called Al Moro, which is two blocks from the Trevi Fountain. And as you push your way through the the um, the street, the main street, just off where El Moro is, was gorged with people. And there's a big pizzeria over here. Uh, it gorged with people. I take a right, and there's El Moro. And it was maybe one third full, quiet, sedate, civilized, wonderful, wonderful food. And this is one of the more expensive places. This is where the pasta may cost you twenty dollars, but it feeds two people uh, at least a big portion. And I'm talking about fungi porcini and season and, and truffles and stuff. Wonderful food. And I found this across the board that every single restaurant I went to. First of all, you do want to make a reservation at night because they will fill up, but they don't fill up in the way that the pizzerias have people yeah. lined outside the door um, uh, that you find. So that's the saving grace. Uh, the other thing, the only way to do it, and I'm going to do this in January, uh, I'm going to land in Milan, which itself used to be an industrial uh, business city. Uh, Milan has become very hot and trendy. So there, too, you'll find some of the same problems that I described in Rome and Florence and Siena and Naples and other cities. Um, so we're going to get there and immediately hop on a train and go to the uh, northeast. The Milan is in Lombardy and to the northeast is Emilia Romagna, where the principal city there is Bologna. Very few people go to Bologna as tourists. Um, Italians will. It's a wonderful city. And then they have these smaller cities like Parma, which is where you get Parmigiano from, which was a, once a royal city, very beautiful city. All of these are very clean. I mean, you could eat off the streets. And Piacenza, another small city. They're not towns, they're small cities. And uh, so I'm going to be going to those types of places where I can drive into town, I can park, and I can get a reservation, and I can still get a hotel room for $100, $150. The most expensive one in town would be... Uh, you know, three hundred dollars, something like that, and I'm going to rent my little Fiat and uh, drive from place to place, or hop on the trains, which are ridiculously inexpensive. The intercity trains. Um, the I went from uh, Rome to Civitavecchia. Civitavecchia is the port, which by car, if you can hop to the taxi, it's about uh, an hour away, and will cost you one hundred and fifty, hundred eighty dollars. The a train ticket from Rome to Civitavecchia, which takes about an hour, 
is six euros. That's six dollars and twenty cents. Um, Jeez, what a difference! The train's a terrific way to go. Uh, so, John, the the besides these smaller cities, Italy has, as you've reported on for many years, has a plethora of wonderful coastal uh, towns, wine regions, and and vacation spots. Mm-hmm. Um, besides the smaller cities, am I correct? Absolutely. I was on this clipper ship uh, where I was asked to give three lectures, which paid for the trip. Um, and um, we stopped at uh, cities that and towns that people really never really go to, like Messina, wonderful town, Lipari, very quiet. It's an island, basically. Um, and um, then down to Sorrento, which is more a little bit more touristy but Sorrento is where you get the boats to go to Capri which <laughs> Capri sure. they must have 50,000 people a day visiting and you catch the ferry boats from either Sorrento or from Naples and uh it, it, it's Capri's been ruined and one of the one of the ports of call was Amalfi which is on the Amalfi coast mm-hmm. and all those towns there are overrun um and um Ma- Amalfi is the center of it, you walk through this archway, the center of it is no bigger than a football stadium, a rather modest football stadium, and has a beautiful piazza, which is full of tourists who are having coffee and gelato. And then there's a lovely cathedral right in front of you. And then there's basically one street leading up to the left. And you walk up that street, guys, and all that's there uh, pizzerias, tchotchke shops, ceramics, limoncello, and <laughs> lemon soap, and that's all that's there. So, oh, Amalfi, Amalfi was where the Brits and the Germans used to go to just relax because nothing went on there. You just relax there. Um, forget about it. It's one of the most intense experiences you can have at this point, and uh, it's, it's just been ruined. But then we went to Ponza. Now, Ponza is a place where 10 years ago, nobody went. It's a little rocky island about an hour by uh, hydrofoil from Rome, but it's kind of caught on. But it's still um, pretty much undiscovered. You can walk around Ponza in an hour and a half, the whole island. The trouble is, (laughs) it's nothing whatsoever to do with Ponza. (laughs) Nothing. You go there for a day or two. and and, Well, that might be a blessing. (laughs) <laughs> well, it is. If you if you seriously just want to relax and, and go to the beach, um, as you suggest, uh, up and down the um, Turanian and the Adriatic coast are uh, wonderful places like that that are not overrun. Um, yeah. Puka is not yet overrun. Basilicata is not yet overrun. Abruzzo is not. But um, so that's that's going to be. And this goes for France too. Um, the last time I was in France, I was in Paris for a couple of days, but I got out. And I went to Orléans, I went to Normandy, I went to um, Saint Malo, uh, a number of other places, Lourdes. Um, and these were um, really nice places to go, and they weren't crowded. Um, and the same for, uh, you don't want to go to London, but go outside of London. Um, but don't rent a car, because they drive on the other side of the street. And every time I've gone and, and rented a car, I've almost gotten killed several times within six days including when I was in Wales, got the car and driving on the wrong side and within one block had snapped off the rear view mirror on the left hand side and the next day snapped off the one on the right hand side. I'd like to take this back to a little more positive note because it looks like we're going down a narrow road into Horrorland, um, especially when we've been talking about in the past uh, uh, the recent past with the pent up demand of people traveling and all of the normal places and the normal uh, off, uh, uh, off the mainline times for people to travel. If you have some, some time flexibility, which many of us do who are watching this program, uh, it seems that while the uh, off season may get narrower, maybe it's yeah. January, February only now, in a lot of places, but it seems the two messages that you've delivered to us is that you can still have a good time if you go to that narrower off season yeah. and off the beaten path. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Stay stay off the uh, stay out of the main cities, at least during the high season. And uh, I mean, you know, the, it's not wonderful to go to Italy when it's not warm, but uh, it's it's warmer than New York City would be, but not as nice as where you guys live. But in the, but in the winter, of course, Sicily, which is further south, mm. and Greece, Greek islands and others, they still are quite warm. Um, so consequently, those are places if you want to just uh, toddle yeah. around in 70 degree weather, that's fine. Good advice. Appreciate it, John. Sure. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.